Hello, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing well. Kelly, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm doing well. All right. Cool. So welcome, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the DAT, Perceptual Ability Test. Um, did either of you guys actually make it to the first Excuse me. First DAT session. I didn't. I didn't either. I mixed up the dates. No, no worries. Um, so that one should be up on YouTube here shortly. So uh, keep an eye on the link. There'll be links to the YouTube videos from the, uh, where you got the link for this one for this session. So since I want to have a fairly clean copy for that video, I'm going to restart again because of the sneezing and all that. So hello, everybody. Welcome to our session on today's uh, DT prep um, perceptual ability test. I am Doug McLemore. I'm a staff advisor and test prep specialist with the UC Davis HPA. And um, let's get started. So first thing I want to mention today is last time what we did is we covered like what's going on on the test itself. And we saw with this particular test, the DAT, there's several sections. One is a natural sciences section with Ken Fitz bio. Then you have the perceptual ability test, which is the most time crunched section on the test. Um, you have 90 questions and you have uh, not 90 minutes, a shorter, much shorter amount of time to do these questions. You have only about 30 seconds ish, a little more than 30 seconds per question to answer every question. It goes fast. So you got to be just like bam, 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 bam on these questions going through them. So, um, of the two that are here today, have you guys actually done a practice test and seen these types of questions before? Yes. I've done um, not a full length practice test, but I've done practice problems in the different sections. You have seen at least what some of these questions look like. Uh, yes. What, what was the, uh, Kelly, what was it you said? Sorry, say that again. Kellya, or Kalia. How do I pronounce that actually? Oh, um, it's Kelly. Oh, uh, I just said that I, I haven't practiced on this one. So one of you have, one of you haven't. Um, basically, what these are going to be about for that, for those of you have haven't, is they're going to give you visual puzzles in essence, and that's the way I like to think of these things as visual puzzles. And your job is to solve those puzzles quickly. Um, this is unique to the DAT. There are no other common tests that actually test this kind of information. So, um, our skill, I should say, this is not something you can study for us. Uh, information wise, you would study for this trying to develop a skill. And if there is one thing to start working on before you start studying for the DAT as a whole, it is the perceptual ability test because it is something you can develop as a skill and you get better with it over time. There's not stuff to memorize with it, except for maybe the rules of how things work. So let's take a look at each of these types of questions then. <clears throat> So the first of these is called the apertures type questions, um, AKA what everybody else calls the keyholes. Um, you're trying to fit this object on the left through the different holes on the right. And you want the one that fits perfectly. <clears throat> it can't be too small. It has to fit the, the, um, the orientation of it. Uh, the different pieces have to go through like flush with the edge. Um, so you can turn the object in any direction. However, the way they orient this, it's very clear that they're using the same three orthographic projections they use on these questions, which is top, front, end. So you can see the object on the left where you can see the top side is this side. The front side is this face, the one sort of front and to the left, and the end is the one that's off and to the right. <clears throat> Um, they could veer from that. They could go from that backside, but it's pretty unlikely they would be able or be willing to do that on questions. Most of the time, it's going to your keyhole is going to be one of those three orientations as you're looking at that object on the left. So 
one of the things I say is just look at which apertures fit first off. Like, okay, aperture A, is that a top view, an end view, or a front view of the object? <clears throat> top that corresponds to the top view is there any other top views that work c. Any other? c yeah c is a top view so what i would encourage you to do is do that identify like a and c are top views and compare contrast the two what is the difference between a and c Is it just the way they're oriented? No, there's got to be more than just the way they're oriented because the orientation doesn't matter. <clears throat> what matters is the actual shape itself. So there is something different visually between C and A. What's the difference? My, excuse my terrible drawing, man. But you have to see this visually and I uh, also, so you can't get to draw in the pictures. What's the deal with the pointy thing in C compared to the pointy thing in A? C is a lot longer. Yeah, C points past the back end of the block where A is flush with the back end of the block. Looking at the app, looking at the object, does it look like C is sticking way out behind the back or is it coming flush with the back? I think it sticks out a little bit more. I'm not too sure. What do you think, Kalia? Or sorry, Kalia? Um, I'm not too sure either. But... So this is where we, I'm talking about this is a skill we have to flex. Turns out it's actually flush. That comes up and that doesn't gonna stick out as far as C is sticking out. So we can eliminate C for that reason. So that doesn't necessarily mean A is correct, but it is a distinct difference that I can eliminate using. Um, what about B? Is that a top, a front, or an end view? It's an end view. That's an end view, as is E, because we got that little thing sticking out on the side, that's gotta be only visible, that's gonna only be visible from the end. So what are the differences between those two? The middle portion on B is a lot um, bigger between those two rectangular spaces. Okay, yeah, it looks like this chunk here is bigger than this here. Um, and so does, which one can we eliminate for what reason? <clears throat> I think you can eliminate E because it's too skinny. Okay. I was also going to say we can eliminate B because it's also too thick. Yeah. Because in either case, it doesn't look like it's going to be that much or that little, so we can get rid of both B and E. So again, we're, we're comparing contrasting to see the differences so we know what to look at in that original shape. And that's what you're trying to do is identify characteristics of the original shape that work. And then, of course, we've got D, which by process of elimination must be the front view. So that thing going through front ways. So there's nothing to compare and contrast except with the original um, object itself. What do you think? What's wrong with D, if anything? I think the top block. Um, it's too small. It should be a little bit longer. Oh, yeah, I wasn't even thinking that. This looks like it comes past the halfway point of the block, and this looks like it comes right up to the halfway point. So I think that's a good reason. I was also thinking that this is also a little too deep for what we're seeing over here. So we can get rid of D, which means my final answer must be answer choice A. Now, keep in mind that this is something you got to do in your mind. You don't have a lot of time to be drawing stuff, although drawing different projections might help you. 
but this is something you got to do in less than 60 seconds. You just gonna be looking at this going, nope, not E, not B, those are bad. And then C versus A, and yeah, C's out, A still looks pretty good. And, you know, and being able to go through the objects in pretty quick succession like that, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. So there we go. That's how we would approach apertures. Any questions on what you're expected to do in an aperture type of question? <clears throat> All right, similar questions are the view recognition, aka what everybody else tends to call orthographic projections. Um, these are likewise um, dealing with that whole top front end view, but in a more explicit way. So they're going to give you two of the views and you have to find the third. Sometimes they give you the top and the front and you got to find the end view. Sometimes you gotta, you're given the front and the end, you got to find the top view and so on. So there's three different combos that you could see there. Whatever the case, you have to understand how the object moves when you go from one view to the other. So if I'm looking at the top view and I want to rotate it to the front view, you can't really tell from what they're showing you. You have to understand that when you're moving this object, and I'm going to put my screen on for a moment, uh, my video on for a moment in here, and when you're manipulating that top view, You've got to understand that they're pulling it backwards and laying it flat to get the front uh, the front view. So the top of it's going to fold down and lie flat in order to get that front view. If you don't know that, if you think it's going the other direction, you could very much misinterpret it. Or when you're looking at the front view, to get to the end view, they're rotating it, if I'm looking at it from the top, counterclockwise in order to get it to that end view, like make sure that I did that right. Um, <laughs> because I've got to mirror it because of the camera. So if I'm looking at the front view, and I want to get to the end view from the top, it's going to be, sorry, if I'm looking at it from the top, it's going to be clockwise rotation. So if you're looking at the front view, then it's going to be a clockwise rotation so that should have looked clockwise to you guys in the video so the front end goes to the end view by rotating clockwise and then the top view turns to the end view by rotating clockwise as well you're taking this edge and moving it to here and this edge and moving it to here that kind of manipulation so there's a lot of different little weird manipulations that you got to figure out and how these things are working. Now, it used to be that um, the, the vertical line, the horizontal line test worked very, very well for a lot of these questions. They only work partially well anymore because they've actually made the problem significantly more difficult in recent years, well, actually in like the last decade. But it's always a good place, place to start. Like in the front view, how many horizontal features do I see? If I were to look at that and count horizontal features, I've got one, two, three, four, five that would all be occurring at different heights. Well, that's also got to be the case in the end view. I have to have five horizontal features. Are there any answers I can eliminate using that strategy? A and D. A doesn't have enough, and D. it has five, but there's something wrong with one of the five. What is it? Sorry, say that again. It has five horizontal features, but what's wrong with one of those horizontal features? For A? For D. Oh, for D? Three doesn't, A only has four horizontal features. So you can get yeah. rid of a number. Five, our D has five horizontal features, but one of them's funky. It's the, the, um, the right portion. It's too, it's too long. It shouldn't be. Yeah, on the post the is too high. That horizontal yeah. feature is too high up in there. So we can get rid of D. <clears throat> when it comes to vertical features, we should see the same number of vertical features in the, um, front view into the top view so we can go vertical this direction we can go horizontal this direction the problem between here and here is we got to turn horizontal into vertical or vice versa 
So if there's one, two, three, four horizontal features, there has to be one, two, three, four vertical features in these. So this is what we call the line test. And B and D or B and C both pass the line test going from top to end. So then we have to think about other things like placement. So if I'm rotating that block um, from front view to end view, remembering we're turning it clockwise, is this post going to be visible from the front? Or sorry, from the end view, or is it going to be invisible from the end view? Visible. It's going to be visible, which means which one must it be taking account for dash lines being behind and solid lines being in front? B. It's got to be B. So there's our best answer. So just getting used to the rules of the rotation. Now, this is something you can use to pr practice this is to like use blocks like Legos or something like that that stick together. You can make your own items and then just generate a few views to generate your own questions. Or honestly, get something like DAT Booster or um, DAT Bootcamp. They have perceptual ability problem generators. And they generate these things on the fly. So you get more or less an unlimited number of practice questions for these things. And again, always differences. It's always about the differences. So any questions about the view recognition type questions? All right, angle discrimination. So <clears throat> these are just angle ranking. That's what I would call them uh, most of the time. Um, so they're gonna be always listing the answers from smallest to largest angle. That's just a rule you have to know about the way the answer choices work uh, because they do list them. They tend to list them with two dash, one dash, three dash, four, instead of using greater than last than signs. Um, you can't touch the computer screen. That's very important. If you're caught touching the computer screen or holding your hand up or something, that could be disqualification. Um, and then again, there's only always one correct answer. So first thing I would do on these types of questions is figure out what's the smallest and what's the biggest. So looking at these angles, which one do you see as the smallest and which one do you see as the biggest? Always go for the extremes first. Four looks yeah. like it's the biggest and then... Okay, if that's the case, can I eliminate any answer choices? Yes, B. B, and then what's the smallest? Um, I want to say three. Three is the smallest, which does that eliminate any answer choices? A and D. A and D are out, that makes C our best answer. Now, it's not always that easy. Sometimes you'll get two answers with three in there. So you might also get this opportunity or this option, three, one, two, four. So then I have to actually rank one and two. So always rank against two angles against each other rather than trying to rank all four answers versus each other. So then in my head, I'm comparing one versus two or two versus one. But notice how those angles are flip-flopped versus each other and they're separate from the page. Worse yet was if it, if it were like one and four that I had to compare. Um, one of the tricks actually is uh, letting your eyes defocus. Do you ever look at one of those 3D posters where you're like, you just stare through it and you see the 3D picture? Do kind of the same thing. If you can do that, you can make those, those angles sort of overlap a little bit on top of each other. Because you just put your head a certain distance away from the screen. And then when you defocus your eyes, your eyes are going to see them at the same time. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is compare to nearby 180 degree or 90 degree angles. So what you might do is for this one in box two, compare it to the 90 degree angle that you see here, and then do the same for this 90 degree angle with more, number one and see what the relative size is that, that, that you see for it. For, so acute angles I would do versus the 90 degree angle. Obtuse angles I would do it versus a 180 degree angle something like that, a line. So that way you can get that comparison. So like, try to convince yourself, can you see that two is smaller than one? Yes, I think so. 
that. This one's a pretty fairly clear cut case. They're not always so clear cut. Um, so this is again one of those places where you just have to you just practice, 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 and you'll start just seeing it uh, more effectively. So these are hard to have any strategies for because there's not a lot of strategies to compare angle sizes. You just kind of got to do it, unfortunately. Um, paper folding or hole punching. These are some of my most fun ones. I like these. These are fun to do because um, what they're going to give you is on the left, you're going to get some series of folds and they're going to punch a hole. And then on the right, they're going to give you a bunch of square pieces of paper and they're going to show punched holes as solid circles. So the thing that I would suggest doing is start with the hole punch and work your folds backwards. So if I'm looking at the hole punch example here, where would that show up? What circle? If I'm using row, column, like um, relationships, what row, what column should that circle appear in? The second column at the very right. Second row or, column? or second row, yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately they all share that, so I can't eliminate anything. All right, so then I'm going to unfold that thing. I'm gonna pull that fold down and lie it flat. So I had a circle here, and then I opened the hole uh, or opened it up. Where's that circle going to be uh, then up here? The third row, fourth column. Yeah, it's gonna. It's got that mirror plane right here, so it's gonna mirror it down to that third row, fourth column. Any answers I can get rid of based on that? Uh, B and C. Yeah, B goes away. C goes away. So now I've got A versus D versus E. All right. Then we're gonna unfold it yet again. So both the fold, both the holes are in what's getting unfolded. And so should both the holes translate or only one of the holes translate when I unfold it now? I think both. Both the holes should translate. And where are they gonna be located? Fourth row, column two and three. So I'm gonna have fourth row, two and three, which narrows my choices a little bit more. Which other answer choices am I gonna get rid of? <clears throat> A and E, or just A, yes. I can get rid of A, not necessarily E. I mean, I can get rid of E, I mean, because if they're both going to move with this fold, then even if I unfold this thing, it was, it's probably on the fold right now, it's going to just open up and still be in that number two position, column two. So E is out, D is in. So really, these questions are focusing on symmetry. And your understanding of how, like, if I unfold it, I got to watch the symmetry of that fold. And these are also very practicable at home. You can go to like a hobby store, like, um, is it Frank's or Fred's or somebody's, um, <laughs> whatever that craft store is, get just square pieces of paper. You can just buy that stuff really cheap, like a buck and get you like a hundred sheets. Get a cheap old hole punch and just do different patterns of folding and like try to predict what it's going to look like. Um, so that's a good way to practice these types of questions. <clears throat> again, practicing is always good. Plus, also, you have the way to, um, you can just use, again, DAT Booster or DAT Bootcamp or something like that with their question generators or Crack DAT. I do feel that practicing with manipulatives, something you touch and hold in your hand, is a good choice because it'll allow you to um, really get down and dirty and see what's happening. The next type are cube counting, which have recently changed. So if you knew any rules about these from before, you, uh, Lucas, you could probably make sure you're updating your knowledge about these. Because in the past, there were no hidden cubes and it made a, or no floating cubes and it made a point of it. There are now floating cubes in these problems, meaning the, the bottom can now be painted on at least some of the cubes. That was never the case before. In the case before, you would never have the bottom painted. So 
what's the best way to do these? Well, first thing to remember here with these is that the cubes are, are the cube questions are going to come in sets. So they'll give you one stack of cubes and they're going to ask you multiple questions. So it actually behooves you to just count all of the cubes first. Don't even try to answer the questions. Just go through, set yourself up a table with zero. So um, the, the number of sides painted and the number of cubes that you see that kind of painting. You can see zero, one, two, three, four, or five sides painted. You could never see six. So at least one side is always touching either the bottom or something else, another cube. So do we see any hidden cubes, basically? Zero would be the hidden cubes. Are there any that are like holding something up that are at the bottom of the stack in the middle of the object? Um, I don't think so. No, and these are going to be uncommon to find zero cubes, zero sides painted cubes. Because they're, the only way you're really going to see that is if there's a pyramid of cubes. The pyramid, the middle block under the top of the pyramid is assumed to be there. Now, we know there's not a hidden block behind this one because the, it explicitly the rules state that there's no hidden blocks unless they are supporting other blocks, meaning it has to be the bottom of the stack. So there's no way they're going to be a bottom of the stack in that guy. Okay, so we got zero. How about one side painted? Do we see any one side painted cubes? No, I don't think so. Doesn't look like it in this case either, but we do see some twos. Where are our first twos? How many do we have? Is it the very middle one? Yep. This one's a two-sided two painted. Okay. Are there any others? Uh, I'm not too sure. What about this one? Oh, uh, yeah. That one's also two-sided. Are there any others? And then the one on the right in the middle of the the two blocks. That one? Uh, I think it was the middle one, the one to the right of it. No, that one's got three sides painted. Oh, yeah, that's right. The back side is also there. But this one, when I, when I put a red dot on, that one's got two sides because it's got the left and the right. There's a block behind it. There's a block in front of it. There's a block on top of it. Oh, uh, yes. And then two and then two and then two because that's a corner cube so there's actually quite a few twos there's one two three four five six twos and if you've ever played the game have you played the game minesweeper on a computer before i have it's actually a good game to practice doing this because you're doing a lot of the same thing of seeing like different types of cubes that re reiterate themselves so cute corner cube under a cube is always two, two sides painted. Uh, middle cube under a cube is two sides painted. Uh, middle of a row, cube in front, cube left and right, also always a two-sided cube. So you start recognizing those patterns and then so on and so forth. And that's what you would do on these kinds of questions. So let's try three side painted. The one that I said before. Yep, that's a three. And then the one that's like directly across from it on the other side. That's a three. And then the one to the, oh my God, it's so hard to say. Yeah, that one. <laughs> that one's a three. There's one more three, but well, two more threes. Uh, the one at the very back that you can't really see. This one? Yeah. And then the one to the left of it? That one. Yeah. Yep. So we got one, two, three, four, five, three. Any fours? Uh, uh, 
Uh, I don't think so. Four. Oh. Four. Oh, so we don't count the bottom. The bottom just, is never counted. The yes, bottom, I forgot. <laughs> yep. Okay, so, so yeah, that course. one, that one. I don't think so. So there's two fours, and the ones that sit atop the whole mass are the ones that we can say are our fives. So one, two, three, four of those. So it seems like a very, pretty big time investment up front, but it's actually worth it because now you can answer all the questions. You go bam, bam, bam. Because like, what's the answer to figure A or to, to, to the question here? Uh, D. It's D because we've got six cubes with two sides painted. Boom, that's our answer. So it, it's something that's worth doing, even though it takes a little bit of time. Um, this is also a place where you can do some uh, practice. Um, if you've ever heard of Unifix cubes, or if you go to a teaching store, like an education store, that's what are called Unifix cubes. And you can like make these patterns of blocks and just set them down on the table and like put them at an orthographic projection like that, like look at it from the side. You should be able to, you can mimic these things to, again, get your hands on there. All right, and finally, the last type which are 3D form developments, aka the pattern folders, pattern folding questions. Um, some of the hints on this is, is really just focus on the shaded or the pattern parts. So if you say the shaded part or a pattern part, look at how they're gonna be rel related together. So for example, I have two features on this thing and they will always be folded to the outside. They will never fold them inside so they're hidden. That's one of the rules of the problems. So that shaded triangle and that circle, will they share an edge or will they not share an edge? They share an edge. They're going to share an edge because when I fold it, these two edges are going to come together. So can I get rid of any answer choices that show them not sharing an edge? C and D. C and D. So that's one very powerful technique is compare the surface features and see, will they share edges? Will they not share edges? If they won't share edges, we would have gotten rid of A and B. If they do, then I would have gotten rid of C and D. Things like that are very, very useful. Um, you don't want to try to actually fold this thing up in your mind and see the picture, because that's going to take a lot longer. Now, look for other inconsistencies with the shaded areas in the pictures. So the circle, I really can't say. The circle, it's right in the middle of the face and both of the remaining pictures. Although I'm tempted to feel that this circle is a little bit too what? Does it look centered? No, it doesn't look centered. Yeah, it doesn't look centered. That's and that stuff is done on purpose. So you could probably el eliminate based on that. But there's something that's even more of a clincher here. So if I look at the way the shaded triangle works, the right angle on that shaded triangle is going to be located where? Is it going to be located at a corner or is it going to be located in the middle of a face? The middle. Middle of a face. What is it here? Oh, it's at a corner. At a corner. Here it's in the, in the middle. So A is out, B is in. So when you're looking at these features, these are the kinds of things you're looking for for relative placement. Is this at a corner? Is this at an edge? Is this going to be on a face, two faces away? Um, and chirality plays a role in this. Something from organic chemistry that you learned about also plays a role in this because the, you know, whether it's to the left or to the right when you fold it up, that can make a difference. So those are all these little different things you can, you can, you can identify in how you tackle these problems. So um, these are harder to practice ex except for with a uh, problem generator. Um, they're harder to practice because it's really hard to find just patterns like this you can cut out and manipulate. Um, it's doable, but and some of the companies out there will actually provide you with patterns like this you can play with 
to just sort of get familiar with it. But now let's try to take this home and see if we can answer some questions. So here I've got a series of six questions. And um, I'm going to give you more time than you should have, which is five minutes to do these six questions. Take, a, take these five minutes and actually try to answer these questions. On your marks, get set and go. All righty, were you able to get to all of them? Yes. All right, excellent. So um, I did select some that I would call fairly straightforward for this, just because I wanted to see if you could apply them. So what do you think for number two? I said A. I would agree. And right away, a couple. one of the things that really jumped out at me was size. Did you use that to your advantage? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, because the figure itself looks pretty large compared to any of the others. B, C, D, and E are all too small to simply fit that thing. So that's probably the best way to solve that question. Although E's out because it doesn't divot, have that big divot in the middle. D's out really because of size and it doesn't have that sort of extra squared off space in there. And then B and C definitely size. That, that's pretty easy call. So hey, yep, bingo, A is the right one. How about 16? I said B. B is correct. Now, what I see a lot of times with this one is people get it down to B versus C. You can see the gaps in there. So most people don't pull this one or this one. A and they get rid of A and D pretty quickly. What's the difference between B and C? The end view, like they're they're like triangles. They don't have that that straight edge. Yeah, there's no straight edge on there, even though it kind of kind of looks like they might be triangles in one case from one view, but then you flip it and you see the other view. They're always squared off at the edge, so that means it's got to be B because C has the triangle views and it doesn't work. So B is our answer. Correct. How about number whatever this one is, the angle discrimination? T. That is going to be C, yes. And again, I, I should have picked one that didn't have the largest smallest combo give you the correct answer. But we can see pretty quickly two is the smallest. We can see pretty quickly that one is the largest. So there's our answer B. Like I said, they're not always that simple, but make sure you're comparing two angles at a time. How about 47? C. Agreed. So I put a hole there. It's going to flip down to there. And then when you unfold it left to right, it's going to flip over to there. C is our best answer. Boom. About 62. Um, I thought it was C. It is. Yeah. What's notable about this one being C? That Where are all the cubes? They're invisible. <laughs> all three of those cubes are invisible because they're in that back corner holding up that top block. And so we've got three cubes doing that that have two sides exposed. What I sometimes get people to do is answer more than three because they think these two are two, like that one and that one. But remember, other sides are exposed than what we see. So that's right, three cubes. Good job, I can't trick you at all. Number 77. I think it's C. And why not D? Um, because the the curvy the curvier sides like the uh, oval shape almost like one fourth of a circle. Um, those are like longer than the shaded. So uh, D is like a, a sector of a circle, not this kind of long stretched out shape. Yeah. Sure. Uh, a could be, but why not A? I think because one of the the rectangular or both of the rectangular sides, they're equal. Yep, and it's actually the same shape as D, except we're not being shown the, the shaded side. Oh, yeah. So A and D, no good. B, the shadings on the long side instead of the short side makes C our best answer. So this is what the PAT section is all about. 
but just faster. We just have to make these quick, fast decisions, pu just punching through these questions like crazy. So let me open the floor for questions. Any questions about the PAT section, what you might expect. Um, I think I'm okay. Um, I think for me, uh, I reviewed like the keyholes, the top front end, the ankle ranking and like the hole punching, but it was my first time seeing like the cube counting and the pattern folding. So it was a little bit, um, took me a lot longer to like process, but I just know that I just have to keep practicing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and like I said, uh, I think you're, there's, there's two key forms of practice. There's manipulative practice, which honestly, that's some of the best practice, but it can get a little more expensive because you got to buy the stuff to do it. Um, well, like you also got to pay for a question bank, but the question bank is also really good. And not the question bank, but the question generators. So if you look for PAT generators online, you'll find a couple websites, most notably Crack DAT, DAT Booster and DAT Bootcamp that have um, PAT generators. And right now, DAT Booster, I think, has that for five of the question types. DAT Bootcamp has for four of the question types and Crack DAT has for four of the question types. So DAT Booster is right now kind of leading that frontier of, gener of having PAT generators. Um, they're working on the sixth one, they let me know. Um, and as our Crack DAT, they're working on getting the rest of the two. Um, or not Crack DAT, DAT Booster. I'm not sure if Crack DAT is um, working. I haven't been able to get them. Actually, it's the other way around. I haven't been able to get DAT Bootcamp to tell me one way or the other. But Crack DAT is working on the additional two to get their, themselves up to the six as well. So those are very good resources for practicing your PAT section, plus a lot of other things. So next time we're gonna have the reading comprehension. Uh, we're gonna go over some tools in the trade for the reading comprehension section. We're actually gonna do some reading comprehension questions. Um, that will be on July 26th, back in the evening. Um, we've had to play some games with this schedule just because of holidays and whatnot. And we were normally gonna split this one this week because we, would, we split the DAT with the OAT, um, but we'll be back together again with the OAT folks for reading comprehension on July 26th at six o'clock to 10, well, 6.10 to seven. Um, if you haven't already signed up, go ahead and sign up for our mock test coming up on July 24th. You can get there through our test prep page and um, we'll get a practice test under your belt. Um, otherwise, if you have other questions, you're always welcome to drop in from 8 to 12 on Mondays. No my drop in hours. Uh, you can also, uh, the specific for test prep can help you out with your personal statements and that thing. Um, so you can find the link there through the test prep page as well. So thank you all for coming today. I hope you learned a little bit about how to tackle these things or at least what you're up against if you haven't seen these questions before. Thank you so much. I'll definitely email you or um, reach you if I have any other questions. Okay. Oh, something I didn't mention. Thank you for saying that about emailing me. Um, if you are going to do something like the DAT booster, crack DAT, or DAT bootcamp, I have discount codes for most of those. So um, just let me know if you need the discount code and I can get it to you. So don't buy anything for full price. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again for coming. And I will see you guys in two weeks.